Hmm? Mm -hmm. Colossians chapter 3. I'm getting instructions from the front row. We already did the welcome, didn't we? We didn't do the welcome? No. Lucas, what were you doing? (laughs) Welcome, everybody. (laughs) Welcome, Fairfield. Good to have you this morning. And, uh, and we'll have to say welcome Burlington. We'll have to get that in our minds, won't we? Colossians 3.17, I'm going to talk to you about the name of Jesus Christ and uh, how important it is to your life and mine, uh, more so than maybe we realize. Colossians 3.17, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. I'm going to read that again. And whatever you do, In word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Whatever you do or say, whatever you do or say. In other words, couldn't couldn't we be honest to say everything? Whatever we do in word or deed, do it in the name of Jesus. You know what this scripture is really saying to us is that it's a lordship issue. Is he the Lord of everything you do? Is he the Lord of everything you say? Ouch. Is he the Lord of everything you do? Is he the Lord of everything you say? That's quite a name, isn't it? Do everything, whether in word or deed, in the name of Jesus. Now, the big question is then, do I? Do I live my life under the lordship of Christ? This is a lordship issue. Is my life being lived under the lordship of Christ in my words and in my deeds? Now, this lordship issue though you may not think about it, is about being blessed, being fruitful, being abundant, and being in charge. That's what it means to be under the lordship of Jesus Christ. When God created man in the garden, this was his lordship directive. He blessed them and he said to them, be productive, be fruitful, Multiply, be abundant, increase, be fulfilled, fill it up, replenish. That's what replenish means, to fill and rule. Rule over the earth. Bring it under subjection. This is the lordship of Christ over you. That was his lordship directive. It's how God created you. It's how God made you and I. He blessed them. Now, most of us don't even think about what blessing means. But blessing actually means to speak a benefit or abundance or a firm affirmation or a praise or a salute of warm greeting, of love. That's what it means to bless, to speak benefit over, abundant over, affirmation over, praise over, a warm embrace of greeting. You you know literally what bless means is to determine a person's future. I bless you with abundance. I bless you to be fruitful. Not wasteful, I bless you to be fruitful, productive. I bless you to increase and to multiply. I'm speaking over you, your future. Not only your present, but what your future is going to look like. What will my future look like? Abundant. What will my future look like? Productive. What will my future look like? Fulfilled. Who wants to get to the end of their days, meaning whatever age that we determined, you start thinking, you know, gosh, maybe I don't have that much time left. 
You know, kind of like my father used to say, you know, age is like toilet paper. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the closer you get to the end, the faster it disappears. <laughs> to, be, to be blessed is to determine your future of abundance, of productivity, of being fulfilled. What a horrible thing to come to, and many people do, come to at a certain point in their life, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess 60s, maybe 50s, and they start saying, is this where my life was supposed to go? I, I, didn't, I didn't expect my life to get here. I'm not fulfilled. I'm not filled up. I don't, I don't see God's abundance in my life. What is that? It's without lordship. Because that's the lordship of Jesus Christ. To bless you. To speak benefit over you. To speak abundance over you. To affirm you. To praise you. Wow. To greet you in a warm embrace. It determines your future. God bless them. Genesis 1.20 says. So God's wisdom and God's purpose was for you and I to be fruitful, not fruity, <laughs> fruitful, productive, to be in abundance and to be fulfilled. Sin changed it. Sin crippled it. Sin defiled it, corrupted it. What was planned for you changed and it became evil. It became corrupt. And what was meant to be good, everything changed because of sin. You were supposed to be in charge, but not to, not to be a boss over everyone in your selfishness. You were supposed to have abundance but not in the sense of greed without, I've got to get more. And we're, boy, are we, a, are we a society of more? Just a little more. Money really does become a God in people's lives. You were made in the image and likeness of God. And you were always on His mind, even when sin came. In fact, God blessed them by saying, this is not how this is going to end. Even in, even in your death, because everything you do now is filled with death, you separated yourself from me, I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to send a redeemer born of the seed of a woman who will break this lordship of the serpent over you. Made in His image, made in His likeness, you are always on His mind. Remember the psalmist, he looks up at the stars one night, he's outside apparently or where he can see and he's just, he's looking at the sky and the vast stars and the galaxies that you can see in a blur but you can't tell what they are. You're just like, what's that blur out there? It's a, it's a galaxy far, far away, long, long ago. And then you're looking at all that and then you look at the, the, the grandness and the greatness and, and the psalmist says, the psalm say, what is man that you are mindful of him? The affirming, caring, loving God. That's what mindful means. What is man that you such, have such great care, such great love, such great attention to him. Jeremiah says, by the word of the Lord, I think about you all the time. I think about your future and I've planned it for good to give you an expectation, an end, a fulfillment to your life, a glorious end. Plans to do you good. Sounds like Genesis 1, doesn't it? He said that to them in the midst of them being overrun by another nation because of sin and their rejection of His Lordship. He said, this is not my plan. This is the plans I have for you. To do you good. 
to have you fruitful, to fill you with abundance and fulfillment, to give you an expectation. It's a difficult word when you're being overrun by an enemy. All your stuff is being taken by someone else and you're taken into captivity. Psalm 139 says this same thing when he says, um, he says, your thoughts towards me, how great are the sum of them. This is, this is in the psalm where he says, you knew me before I was in my mother's womb. You saw all my parts being knit together. All of your thoughts towards me are so great they can't be counted for the multitude of them. Even knowing ahead of time that you would reject him, that sin would destroy you, that you would get so caught up in his creation rather than in the creator, you would think to yourself that God can't bless me as much as I can bless myself. He really can't make me as productive as I can make myself. He really can't fulfill me in the way that I want to be fulfilled. Let me take charge of that. Even then, God blessed you. The Bible says He planned to die for you to fulfill you before you were even born. Before you were even born. So that sin would never hinder, limit, or destroy His blessing in your life. No wonder Colossians 3.17 says, Whatever you do, whatever you say, do it in the name, the name of Jesus. Why is this? Because it's His authority. That's His authority. It's His blessing. It's His productivity, His fruitfulness. It's His abundance. It's His power. It's His wisdom. It's His ability. God reveals to us that we're always on His mind. He wants you to know who He is because it determines who you are. And He wants you to know it on a daily basis. Whatever you do, whatever you say, do it in the Lordship of the name of Jesus Christ. So when you speak, when you work, when you go to school, when whatever you do, your career, your marriage, your home, your children, your family, whatever you do, whatever you say, do it in the name of Jesus. Can you abuse someone in the name? Can you misuse someone in the name? Can you cheat in the name? Can you lie in the name? Can you, can you commit adultery, fornication, whoredoms in his name? No, he doesn't authorize it, does he? Whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name. I remember one day, my, it was my first date actually. I was 17 and what was her name? Doesn't matter. I was going to pick her up, but she sure was cute, and I, I was as nervous as a cat on a hot tin roof. I couldn't, I couldn't get my footing. I didn't know what I was going to do. How was this going to work? What would I say when I got there? You know, so my mom said to me the stupidest thing as I left. She goes, Monty? Yeah, I said, yeah. She goes, remember, you're going in the name of Jesus. <laughs> that really messed me up. Whatever, whatever lust-filled thoughts I had of satisfying myself that had nothing to do with sexuality, just would she like me, could she like me, does she like me, will we have fun, what will I do, how will I say it, I never thought once about Jesus. Thank you for that burst of enthusiasm. <laughs> Why? Because the name authorizes something. The name authorizes what God is and what He does. The Bible actually gives us a full spectrum of who He is in the Old Testament 
by the names he reveals to people. For example, he says, I'm Jehovah Jireh. The word Jireh means the one who gives provision. He says, I'm Jehovah Sadah. I'm the Lord who fights for you. The Lord, your warrior. It's the name that David used when he went after Goliath. You come to me with a sword and spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, Jehovah Sadah, the one who fights for me. I'm Jehovah Shalom. I am your peace. Not just peace of mind, but literally peace in your life. A fullness without lack. That's what peace is. I have no lack. I'm Jehovah Roi. I'm the Lord your shepherd, the one who guides, cares for, protects. I'm Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah meaning the Lord your victory, your banner. Wave your banner high. This is my victory. I am Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals, the Lord who restores, the Lord who makes whole. I'm Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord who makes you right, righteous. I am El El Shaddai, the Most High Almighty. That is my name. This name of Jesus encompasses all of these definitions, all of his authority to be your warrior, to be your healer, to be your master, to be your guide, to be your shepherd, to be the one who cares, protects, the one who leads you. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name. It encompasses all of it. So, this means that this means He wills. He wills your provision. Whatever that need is. He wills your provision. Jaira, in the name. My checkbook is not my provision. If it is, I'm in trouble. My income is not just my provision. He is my provision in every setting. What if I don't have a job? He is my provision. Well, what if there's famine? He'll take you to a brook, feed you with birds, bring food to you because He's your provision. He's, he wills your victory over your giants. Sada, the name of Jesus. Jehovah Sada. He wills your victory over every giant you face. He fights for you. I can't deal with this giant of grief. He fights for you. I don't know how to... I don't know how to live now in the middle of this loss, divorce, death. Well, now what do I do? He will fight for you. You're always on his mind. He wills for you to win. He's your, he wills for your safety. He wills for your well-being. He wills for your full supply. Shalom. You know how they say it in Israel? Shalom, shalom. Peace to you coming, peace to you going. Fulfilled in your coming, your going. It comes from Deuteronomy. He'll bless you coming in, he'll bless you going out. He's the one who cares for you. He's your divine guide. Well, I don't know what step to take next. I don't know if this is what I should do or what I shouldn't do. Should I invest? Should I buy? Should I sell? What do I do to restore this relationship? How do I go forward? What do I do next? He's your shepherd. He will guide you. He is Roi, the name. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name. Your victory, your healing, your right standing, Rafa, Sigkanu, Nasi, He's always everything you need, Lord. So, 
whatever you do, in word or deed, do it in the name of Jesus. Because you know then what He wills. This would pretty much cover everything, wouldn't it? School, sports, band, music, friends, social media. Do you post in the name of Jesus? Do you put your gripe out there in the name of Jesus? Do you tear into somebody whom you don't even know in the name of Jesus? How you doing? You doing okay? The name, it authorizes you. It authorizes you. James says, without that name, you'll do stuff in your own wisdom. Because Satan wants to divide you or separate you from it. Just like the garden. If I can separate you from God, I can separate you from your blessing. Separate you from God, I can separate you from your fruitfulness. If I separate you from God, I can separate you from your abundance. Well, Pastor, can't people get rich without God? Uh huh. But it's not abundance. How do you know? Because I talk to them, it's never enough. It's not enough to control what they want to control, so they want to control more. There's no authority of Jesus in it. Jesus said that woman who gave a couple mites gave more abundantly than the guys who gave a whole lot. That's a different look in abundance, isn't it? It's not God's will for you to be without abundance. James 3 says, when you, when you follow your own desire of fruitfulness and abundance and, and fulfillment, you know what it leads to? <laughs> Bitterness. Bitterness, envy, anger, strife. James says, confusion. He defines it as human wisdom, man's wisdom. He said it's sensual, flesh-driven. It's of the earth, worldly-driven. It's devilish. It creates confusion in your life and, and complaining and arguing. It creates anxiety and tension. Every evil work. And isn't it true when we look around the world today, we can see that every evil work, no matter how much people have, there's no satisfaction in it. There's no fulfillment in it. I got to get something else, another wife, another lover, more money, another car, better iPad, a newer phone. I mean, I got to have it. And it creates a bitterness and an envy and an anger and, then, and an envy. Why don't I have it, God? Wow. All because we reject the name of Jesus. <laughs> oh, happy day. We wouldn't have it any other way until we find ourselves in an end we can't find answers to. All of it leads to evil. All of it. The evil of abuse and the evil of misuse and then neglect and confusion and, and who I am and what I am and what's my purpose and, and I find myself destroying myself without even knowing I'm destroying myself. I have no faith in my future. I'm afraid of my future. It's just about me, 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 me. When God has removed the definition of what is good and what is evil is removed. Like Isaiah says, when you reject God, you start calling evil good. And you start calling good evil. You don't even know what's right and wrong anymore. It's based in man's wisdom, sensual, flesh-driven, earthly, worldly, devilish, spiritually evil. You know, the focus of Marxism, for example, 
was to overturn what they saw as evil and bring about what they believed would be good. To overthrow the idea of the freedom of capitalism and to create socialism or communism or communal provision. Everyone equal. To do that, no one could own anything. So we got to take away private ownership. Government owned everything. And if government owned everything, then government could be good enough to distribute equal to everyone. <laughs> well, government's just as bad as people because government is people. Today, we don't call it communism, we call it DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. And it's not done in the name of Jesus. It's a rejection of God. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Just like capitalism can be controlled by greed, so too governments will control through greed. So diversity, equity, and inclusion is an ungodly dynamic that is a cultural phenomenon that fights against the godliness of Jesus Christ. Here's what Mark said. Here's how I can tell you this. Mark said, individual freedom must be removed. That's not what Jesus said. I came to make you free, and if you know me, you'll be free indeed. Mark said, we've got to get rid of this idea of freedom for the individual. And the only way we can remove it, he said, because people won't vote for it, let's go to the ballot box tomorrow and vote to give up all our freedoms. Mark said, you can't get people to do it. So he said, there has to be a way to overthrow the society to get people to depend and want and desire government to be their Lord. Lenin found the way to make that happen. He said, the way that you do that is destroy the home. That's how you do it. You destroy the home. You change the, the definition of family. Marriage was good. Marriage must be bad. So how do we change the definition of marriage? Because that's the great roadblock. As long as marriage families are intact, people aren't going to give up their rights. We won't be able to manipulate and control the women or the children, because it's under this stupid belief system that God created marriage, and He created it in this way for you to be blessed and fruitful and abundant and to be in charge. So they went after the home. Lenin said, we can change the social structure of the nation by these five elements. Let me give them to you. Listen to how demonic they are. One, equate marriage with slavery. Equate marriage with slavery. The woman has no rights. She has no rights in her home. She's stuck. She's a slave. She has to iron and launder and feed. She's a slave in the home. That's how they pictured it. Because she has no rights, she's a slave in her own home, she's fully dependent on her man, and that just won't do. We need to redefine it. Here's what we'll call it. Disposable unions of affection. Disposable unions of affection. What's that mean? Forget commitment. Just have sex with whoever you want and throw it away. It was an all-out war against marriage and family so that the rule of the state could be achieved. Two policies were written under that. The first, 
was liberation. How do you liberate people from marriage? Divorce. (laughs) So you could get a divorce in Russia by writing your name on a postcard and mailing it into the government address and you had a divorce. No cost. You just had a divorce just like that. It was legal. You were free from the enslavement of marriage. Second policy under that liberal was abortion on demand. And this was 1920, remember. In 1920, it was illegal in every nation of the world to have an abortion. Why? They saw it as evil. Not in Russia. It's good. So here's how we destroy the home. Let's have divorce and abortion on demand. It will create havoc in that structure where the government, the state, can now become the provider. Today, abortion is called health care. That's an interesting term. That's like calling slavery human resources department. (laughs) The second thing Lennon said, family must cease to be necessary to the individuals, to its members. It must cease to be necessary to its individual members, husband, wife, children. And it must cease to be necessary to the nation. We don't need family. Marriage is a slave owner's model where the husbands are responsible for the well-being of their wife and children. That must go. The state can do better to care for the well-being of women and children. So, with much divorce, a lot of sleeping around, disposable unions of affection, we need abortions, we didn't plan on that one, Let's get rid of it. We got a good thing going. Let's get women into the factories, into jobs. Now what do we do with the children? Oh, they had a good idea. They provided care during the day. They called them day care centers. And it was free. The government gave rights to women for equal wages but that was largely ignored. And in a short amount of time, you created such chaos that you had women who were ghettoized, living in poor urban areas because they had no one to take care of them. I thought the state was supposed to do that. Oh, they did. That was their provision of abundance. They ghettoized women into state-chosen professions. Well, we're going to put you in the work, but well, I don't want to work that way. You're going to work that way. This is the way you're going to work. And we'll ship you to wherever we need you to work. So families were torn apart, shipped to different areas. We didn't see old crazy people that we divorced from that we were so liberated from. And then where do the children go? Well, you can't take care of them. The state can. So we'll have free care providers for them. Third, women can be much more easily socialized than men. And they can be much more easily socialized without men. So practically, what did that mean? Well, that meant men were free to desert their wives. Men were up for divorces as quick as wives did. And it meant they could abandon their responsibilities. They didn't have to do anything, pay for, take care of. They were free, liberated, which made women's wards of the state as well as their children. During the Russian Civil War, 90% of the female population that dominated St. Petersburg, which was the capital of Russia, were on what we call today welfare dependent on the state. Wards of the state. 
That's why they lived in ghettos. Fourth, Lennon said, we have to make men and women equal. This gender difference has got to go. Not in terms of opportunity, but rather to do away with their gender differences. When we post pictures of men and women, they need to look the same. So let's get away from this gender thought difference that women are different than men. It's easier to manipulate, they said, and control them if we can create you ready for it? Gender confusion. We have a new word for it today. Gender dysphoria. The fifth thing he said is that communism must eliminate the need for family. So use phrases instead of family like it takes a village. Anybody heard that phrase before? This is in 1920. The country, the nation is family. No longer use the term fathers and mothers. Individual home ownership must go. It must be subversive to national communism. The state will be the providers of housing and the care for children. Anyone who resists this idea in the name of parental rights must be labeled as selfish and crazy. So they did. They called evil good. And they called good evil. Those who resisted were punished painted as evil, sent away. Women should see children not as their own, but as the communities, the nations. Everyone's children must share the responsibilities of everyone's children. This will make it much easier, they said, to force women into the workforce and into the factories and we can provide communal meals and communal laundry and communal daycare so that the state runs it. God is ignored. The name of Jesus is rejected. Churches were closed. They were enemies of the state. Or they were bribed, given money to communicate a new gospel, a new belief system. And it wasn't the name of Jesus. The goal? The goal was easy. Sever natural ties of family between mother and child, between husband and wife. Forge a new Soviet man who sees government as the new God to be worshipped, honored, esteemed. The government itself began to agitate the community for divorce, agitate it towards abortion, agitated towards gender equality in the name of freedom. In the name of freedom. Liberating you. Because we care about you. They called good evil and evil good. Now when it failed to provide, and it did, now what do you do? Well, you blame, you blame it on its funding. There's not enough money. And you accuse whoever is rich that they don't pay enough tax or that they haven't yet been made to give up their riches for the good of the whole. The state begins to run everything because they know what's best for you. Do you know when you look at the Constitution of the United States... You'll find it was all taken from sermons being preached in early America on the freedom that Christ gives, that Christ gives in His name. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do it in the name of Jesus.
The Bible was the most quoted book in all of our documents. Over two-thirds of all the quotations in our documents, including the Declaration, the Constitution, all the federal papers, all, two-thirds of the quotes are from Scripture. Today, by the way, Russia still ranks number one in divorce in all the nations of the world, still ranks number one in abortions in all the world. When I talk to missionaries, there the plight of human tragedy is just unimaginable. Sadly, these ideas didn't stay in Russia, did they? They were carried abroad to other nations of the world, including America, where we don't call it communism anymore. We have a, we have a better term for it, progressive. Progressive. What are those ideas? They're unbiblical. Does the name of Jesus equate this with these ideas? Does Jesus ever say, I bless you with government? to rule your life, to provide for you, to heal you, to protect you. Government will be your blessing. No. No, in fact, the Bible doesn't say that at all. The right to life and liberty and pursuing happiness were God-given rights. God gave you the right to life. No government. God gave you the right to liberty, to freedom, to choose. He gave you the right to pursue your own happiness. They were God-given rights. And our founders knew it in the Bible and they said, you know what? We need to put this in our Constitution. This is the way, this is the way America should live. The right to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness comes from Almighty God and government is instituted among men to protect those very rights that God gives to them. Romans 13 tells us that government should be subject to God. What? The government should be subject to God and they are to be subject to God to punish what is evil and reward what is good. How can a government know what is good and evil if they're not subject to God? They can't. They'll determine what is good and what is evil on their own. They are to be a servant, a minister of God for our good, to execute wrath upon what is evil. Today we promote it. We instill it into our culture as good, healthy. No wonder we are supposed to pray for those who are in government. No wonder we should vote for men or women who have some sort of submission to God in their life or they'll never have any submission to God in government. Who's the judge of all the earth? When we believe that everyone should be rewarded equal, we're not even biblical. It's called equity. But that's not, that's not the words of Jesus. He said you all have the same equal opportunity. But your choices determine your reward. Whatever you do in the name of Jesus, do it under His authority. Now let's talk about marriage for just a second because I have to close. This is unfair because it's just be a second. Are men perfect? Are women perfect? What happens when you put them together? Yeah, you'll find imperfections. And the problem is we don't see our own imperfections. We see their imperfections because they aren't God they aren't perfect but here's what is true they're God ordained to love and respect you 
even in their human weakness. And when you do marriage in the name of Jesus, you submit to his authority first, enabling you to walk in his power and in his ability, in his forgiveness, in his knowledge. He knows exactly what your spouse needs and he can help you if you will do it in his name. It will cause fruitfulness and abundance. It will cause fulfillment. Doing life in the name of Jesus is doing life by his authority according to his will. Satan hates it. Oh, he hates it because he can't stop it. The name of Jesus defeats him at every point. It binds him. It casts him out. No wonder Jesus said, those who believe in my name will cast out demons. How many marriages have been torn apart by sensual, devilish wisdom that says, I married the wrong person. I deserve to be happy. I need to be loved. I don't deserve to be treated like this. I'm not being fulfilled. I will find love elsewhere. I will not be taken for granted. Do you notice the common theme? I, I, I. There is no authority in I, but there is in the name of Jesus. Years ago, a woman of quiet demeanor, what we would call shy, was desiring to get pregnant, and I didn't know about it. And, and, uh, but she, was not, she hadn't been able to get pregnant. And We had a guest minister come, and he was speaking and ministering. And, and uh, along these lines of authority in the name of Jesus, and by the Holy Spirit, he knew that there were women in the service who were desiring to get pregnant who hadn't been able to get pregnant. And so he stopped in the middle of his ministry and he said, the, the Lord tells me that there are women here who are desiring to get pregnant who haven't been able to get pregnant, but I'm going to pray for you in the name of Jesus and you'll get pregnant. Well, there was a few women who came forward. One of these women was the woman I'm speaking of. This young lady comes forward and I could tell it made her very uncomfortable, just her personal demeanor. And the man prayed over her in the name of Jesus. And after he prayed over in the name of Jesus, she turned to go back to her seat. But the minister wouldn't let her. He said, no, no, you stay here. I want you to pray for the rest of these women to get pregnant in the name of Jesus, to bear a child. Well, she was completely intimidated. She was intimidated just walking up to the front getting prayed for. But he called her to do it. He called her to do it in the name of Jesus. Like a grandmother who's mentoring a young mother how to make her children obey her when she speaks to them, this minister began to encourage her, this woman, and showed her how to use the name of Jesus to pray over women who wanted to be pregnant. It was, it was like she stepped over into another realm. I saw it in her own life as she stepped over into this confidence and boldness to command in the name of Jesus over these women, three or four others, to get pregnant in the name of Jesus. I mean, she just like came out of her shell, for lack of better terms. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name of Jesus. Every one of those women, including her, got pregnant. Nine months, ten months, eleven months later, they were all having babies. We had to increase our nursery workers. Whatever you do in the name of Jesus, do it in His name. No wonder Ephesians 3, 12 says, According to His eternal purpose, which He purposed in Christ Jesus the Lord, in whom you have boldness and access with confidence by faith in His name. The Bible tells us it was God's intention to demonstrate to every demon in hell your authority in the name of Jesus Christ and to show through the ecclesia, the called out ones, the body of Christ, to all the principalities and powers of heavens that you have authority in whatever you do in word or deed. Do so in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and all hell will stammer and and look at what's happening and say, I can't stop it. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Just as the Bible tells us, 
We thank you and worship you and magnify you that you're the one who helps us, who protects us, who delivers us, who heals us, who restores us, who forgives us, who redeems us, who guides us. Everything we do, we should do in your name. It's your will and purpose. I pray, Father, in your name for every bitter heart to be released from its anger and its bitterness against people, against you. The sense that you weren't there for me. Now look what's happened. I called upon you, but nothing took place. But all the while, we were trying to do it in our own authority, begging you to back us up instead of coming in your authority and letting us flow in your will and purpose. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ for all bitterness and anger to leave. It came from demonic sources, not God. And I thank you, Father, for this great deliverance because it is a deliverance that's holding people back from the fulfillment and the plans that you have for them. And I praise you and thank you for doing this great deliverance in them in the name of Jesus. Amen.